impact. Okay, with us, we have Chris Impson. He is the Director of Sustainability for the World Tourism and Travel, um, for the World Tourism and Travel Council. And we also have Miss Claudia Bogensperger, who will also be joining us. She is from the Feder the Foundation of Environmental Education. She hails as the International Green Key Coordinator. And finally, we will hear from Ewald Beemans. He is the owner and manager of Bakuti and Tower Resorts in Aruba. And we are excited to have all of these amazing uh, presenters who will talk to us today about turning net profit, turning net zero into net profits. We're going to start off with an uh, exciting and global perspective of where we are in the carbon footprint for the world and for the Caribbean and do some amazing data and statistics with Chris. Chris, I ask that you please pull up your presentation and we'll get started. Thank you very much, Danae. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be invited to this important panel by the CHJ, who is a great partner of ours, of course, and also with two colleagues who I know very well. That's an added pleasure. Ewald, who is a pioneering WTTC member in terms of sustainability and who will for sure inspire all of you with his real actions that everyone should be replicating. And, and Claudia from Greenkey, who are a key partner of ours in our Hotel Sustainability Basics Initiative. So we're gathered here today to talk about climate and transition to net zero. I'm going to use today's presentation to talk to you through to talk through some of our groundbreaking new data, which we are convinced will serve as a foundation for evidence-based action moving forward. Um, I will also talk uh, about a very concrete initiative, namely the basics, the hotel sustainability basics, to show how everyone can and should start their sustainability journey now because basically there's, there's no excuse for not doing so. The next slide, please. But first, just a, a bit of background on WTTC to set the scene. So WTTC, the World Travel and Tourism Council, is the body representing the global travel and tourism private sector. And as the story goes, uh, 30 years ago, these four gentlemen, so the CEOs of Amex, of uh, British Airways, of Marriott and American Airlines, met with the former US Secretary of State, um, Henry Kissinger, impress upon him the importance of our sector. And Kissinger replied that, well, this was all well and good, but that they should come back to him once they have a unified message and evidence. And so they went off and they formed WTTC for this very purpose, to unify our sector around key messages and priorities and to generate evidence of the sector's importance. And that's what we've been doing ever since. Next. But WTTC is of course most known for its economic impact research. That is our data on tourism GDP, on employment and visitor spend. So for example, our data shows that in 2022, travel and tourism generated almost $8 trillion globally and almost 300 million jobs. And our forecasts show that GDP and visitor spend is set to rise by almost a quarter in 2023 and that the sector will generate an extra 24 million jobs. Next. So these results are really impressive, but our members, who are the CEOs and presidents of over 200 of the largest companies in travel and tourism, well, they've made it clear that times have changed and, and purely measuring economic impact is not good enough any longer. We have to have a more holistic understanding of our impact. So over the last year, with our partner Oxford Economics and with the generous support of Saudi Arabia, we have worked to expand our economic impact research to include the environmental and social footprints of tourism, and indeed to track the sector's progress towards the SDGs. So our indicators include greenhouse gas emissions, energy use and composition, pollutants, water use, material extraction of all kinds, and also so on the social front, the age, wage, and gender profiles of employment. So essentially what our data does is it tells you what the environmental and social footprint is for every dollar of GDP that travel and tourism generates in the economy. And we have this data now across 185 countries, so all the Caribbean economies, uh, addressing both direct and indirect impacts and with a baseline year of 2010 and then from 2019 onwards. Uh, next. So the key data that people are particularly interested in, of course, is the climate data. And here we can see that in 2019, at its peak, travel and tourism contributed to 8.1% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Now, this includes scopes one, two, and three emissions, as well as international transport. Next, please. Um, 
So, so if we drill down to the Caribbean level, we see here uh, the dark blue line that travel and tourism contributed significantly more to overall emissions across the Caribbean region than globally, which is here represented by the gray line. So at its peak in 2019 in the Caribbean, travel and tourism contributed to, to a quarter of the uh, region's emissions compared to 8% globally, as I mentioned. But this is, of course, to be expected, given the relatively larger size of travel and tourism in those economies. In other words, tourism will typically contribute more to emissions in economies with large tourism sectors and vice versa. And we also can see here that travel and tourism very much follows uh, our contribution to GDP as well. So dipping in 2020 and then making this recovery in 2021. So uh, next slide, please. This is the contribution, but it's also important to look at emissions intensity. In other words, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions released per dollar that travel and tourism generates. So the, the, the blue bar here represents the Caribbean and the gray dots are the global averages. So you can see in 2021, for every dollar generated by tourism in the Caribbean, 0.71 kilos of greenhouse gas emissions were released. And this is down from 0.74 kilos in 2010. So that's a good thing. There's a drop there. But you can see here that the emissions intensity is greater in the Caribbean than the global average, which I remind you is here demonstrated by the gray dot. And that is, in all likelihood, primarily due to the region's great reliance on international transport, which is fossil fuel driven. Of course, this is to be expected because we're talking primarily about island states. Now, between 2010 and 2019, we can see that the emissions intensity dropped both globally and in the Caribbean. And this indicates that travel and tourism's uh, growth, so GDP growth and visitor growth, is decoupling from its emissions, which is positive. But the, the decrease in intensity needs to be accelerated greatly for us to reach net zero by 2050, where essentially you need zero emissions per dollar. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Next, please. Now, when we drill down to the subsectors that make up tourism, we can see that transport is indeed a significant contributor to emissions in the Caribbean. So whereas transport contributes about 35% to overall travel and tourism emissions globally, it makes up about half of emissions in the Caribbean. So that's significantly more. And remember, here we are looking at all the scopes. We can break down by the scopes, but here I'm including scopes one, two, three, and transport. So this includes scope one transport, which is basically moving tourists around. So for example, a flight, but also scope three transport or supply chain travel, which includes the emissions generated by moving goods, such as agricultural produce and building materials in the Caribbean. So greening transport is obviously an important challenge globally, but especially so for island transports that depend so heavily on, on aviation. And finally, both globally and in the Caribbean, utilities is the second largest emissions factor, which also shows the enormous importance of moving towards renewable power grids. Next, please. This takes us to energy use and composition. So our data includes the sources of energy driving growth from coal, oil, solar, hydro, nuclear, and so on. And here in this graph, we show the use of low carbon energy forms, which we have defined as wind, wave, solar, and geothermals, as well as hydro and nuclear. And here we can see that the Caribbean's uptake of low carbon energy reached 2.6% of total energy use in the Caribbean in 2021, whilst the global average is closer to 6.5%. Again, this is at least partly explained by the higher relative importance of fossil fuel driven transport in the Caribbean's overall energy use. So tourism really is the business of moving people from one place to another. So until we wean transport off of fossil fuels by electrifying it, by increasing the use of sustainable aviation fuels and so on, this challenge will persist in the Caribbean and globally. Next, please. Now, as mentioned, our, our environmental data also includes water use, pollutants, and material extraction, but I'd be here forever if I went through uh, 
each one of those. But let me just give you quickly a taste of our social indicators, which cover, as I mentioned, the age, wage, and gender profiles of travel and tourism. And here's an illustration. I show female employment in the Caribbean. So on the left here, we can see the absolute numbers of females employed by travel and tourism divided by direct, indirect, and induced. You can see the different colors representing each one of those. And you can see that female travel and tourism employment reached a peak in 2019, unsurprisingly. Of course, it dipped in 2020 by 26% before showing a 17% recovery in 2021. So it's making a good and strong recovery. Um, on the right, we have female employment as a share of total employment in the region. So in 2021, females occupied half of direct travel and tourism jobs in the Caribbean and 38% of all travel and tourism jobs. So that is direct, indirect, and induced. And this trend is typically seen across most regions across the globe. Women may be more highly represented in direct travel and tourism jobs, such as hospitality, but when the broader measures of employment are included, covering sectors like agriculture, mining, fuels, and transport, the female share in tourism approaches that of the, the wider economy. Next, please. Now, this data is, of course, helpful for understanding what's going on and for taking decisions, but we, we need to take action too. And for this reason, WTTC has also created the first ever net zero roadmap for the entire travel and tourism sector, which you can download for free from our website. I do recommend that you go and, and peruse the document. It's a fairly useful one. The roadmap covers five key verticals, so aviation, OTAs, tour operators, hotels, and crews. It provides a status quo of climate action in the sector and across the verticals. It examines decarbonization hurdles and levers for each one of the verticals. And then it sets ambition corridors, depending on what type of business you are and how hard to abate your emissions are. And it ends then with a call to action. So what should you be doing to businesses and also a call to action to governments? Right, I'd like to wrap up my presentation with a concrete initiative we have launched to address yet another challenge in sustainability. And that's namely just getting started. This is what we've realized is, and this is what our members want us to support the sector with. Getting started, making sure that everyone is on board. And so the, the hotel sustainability basics, the idea for the basics emerged <clears throat> as a result of a clear demand from a significant group, a group of global hotel brands to develop sustainability criteria by the industry and for the industry to encourage all businesses in hospitality to begin their sustainability journeys, especially those who are struggling to take that first step. So WTTC was asked to coordinate this initiative and to develop the criteria. We carried out extensive consultations with over 60 global hotel brands and relevant industry bodies such as GSTC, Travelers, Booking, Sustainability Hospital, Sustainable Hospitality Alliance, and so on. And in the end, we got there. We juggled hundreds of criteria but managed to boil it down to 12 fundamental globally aligned sustainability criteria that all hotels can and should implement as a bare minimum. And that served as a stepping stone to more complex schemes. This is not the end point, this is the starting point. So let me give you then with the next slide, a break from my voice uh, with this video. There's no sound, right, as I can hear. Uh, together with uh, WTDC, we worked on the, on the initiative of Hotel Sustainability Basics. Basics is 12 very concrete elements that will help anybody as a consumer to see that progress is being made. The hotel industry is very diverse, so we came together to define that starting level that is really solid, that everyone can do, and that is now verifiable. The process for coming verify is very simple. It's register your interest on the WTTC website, and we will then direct you to our verification partners. We'll be able to take you through the process. There's so many different programs and hotel bases I think is gonna be a good one that allows everyone to get involved and we need to have one currency that every, everybody understands. When I did the verification in my hotel, 80% of the items were already doing it. There's a return in uh, the efficiency, so on utility costs being very high at this time. So anything you do, to reduce your energy costs, to reduce your carbon footprint, to reduce your water, to reduce your waste streams, you're going to save money doing so. It's, it's extremely solid, it's very well defined, it's uh, actionable, so I can already take action, and it's very fireable. And actually the consumers who will come to my hotel 
will know that what I'm doing is the right thing. Thanks. And then the next slide, please. So in the meantime, well, we're, we're delighted to have launched this verif a verification system now for all the properties that would like to get on board. And also that Greenkey, and Claudia's here with us, is one of our official verification partners together with SGS. The process is simple, it's affordable, and for all those hotels that are out there that haven't yet put in place systematic sustainability measures, we like to believe that this is the perfect fit for you. Uh, we have it on our website. I've put a QR code here in case any of you wish to just log on that way. But as I said, it's easily found on our website. And uh, with that, I think that I've spoken more than enough and I end my presentation and I thank you also for your attention. Thank you so much, Chris. That was lovely and a really interesting eye-opener to really understand what's going on globally and also what's happening and how the Caribbean is contributing in comparison to our, uh, our global partners. Next, we are going to hear from Claudia um, at Green Key, who is going to pull up her presentation now and walk us through some of the pathways that some of her um, members at Green Key Global have been looking at getting on the pathway to reach net zero. I'm sure we'll see some practical examples there. Um, and again, this is such an amazing opportunity for everyone who's joining us to take some great notes and understand some of the key drivers that we can that you can put in place, not only through the hotel sustainability basics tool that Chris just shared with us, but also through um, examples of some things that that um, our hotels are doing throughout the world and in the Caribbean to get on track. So Claudia, I will hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm very happy to be here today with you. Um, good afternoon here from Austria. I am going to talk you through, as already mentioned before, um, the path to net zero um, using examples from our Green Key network of certified establishments and showcasing um, their paths towards net zero. Um, my name is Claudia Bogensberger, as already mentioned before, and the entity behind me is the Foundation for Environmental Education. Very quickly, a little bit of background. Um, as the name already says, we at the Foundation for Environmental Education, we really believe that long-term sustainable change can only happen by, on the one hand, implementing the right measures in a tourism establishment, um, but on the other hand, also by raising awareness um, about the topic of sustainability, not only um, towards your customers, but also in your value chain and also towards your employees. Um, at, at FEE, we have, besides Green Key, um, four other programs focusing on um, sustainability and environmental education. But today I'm going to focus on Green Key. Um, and before I start talking about these uh, best practice examples, I would like to remind you, and Chris already started it, where does a tourism enterprise actually create emissions? Um, I think this is something that's really important also for you as, uh, as a tourism service provider, because in order to be able to set the um, sufficient and efficient actions, you need to understand where you're at. So on the one hand, as mentioned before, there is the direct emissions that really come directly from your work, from your operational work on a daily basis. Um, those are the scope one emissions. Then the second um, element and the scope one emissions, they actually only contribute to 8% of the total emissions of an accommodation uh, provider. The scope two emissions are all the indirect emissions, as it has been mentioned by Chris, those include utilities, um, all the emissions that are generated from purchased electricity, uh, heating and cooling, and they account to 37% of the emissions of an accommodation. Um, and the biggest share actually with 55% are all the indirect emissions, um, the scope three emissions. So these include on the one hand, all upstream activities, such as the water consumption, the transportation, as it has been mentioned, cleaning products, all the food and beverage area, 
but something that shouldn't be forgotten, it also includes the downstream activities. So all the waste that is actually created through the operational work of a tourism business. Um, and now I want to um, just uh, remind you all, what are we actually talking about? What is net zero? Um, so the UNWTO has defined net zero as um, actions that on the one hand involve reducing the production of greenhouse gas emission to as near as zero as possible. And for all the, the unavoidable emissions, um, re removing those remaining emissions from the atmosphere. Um, so the most important elements here are that uh, there is the one element of reducing emissions and then the other element of removing remaining emissions um, using, uh, for example, example, carbon capture or removal technologies. Um, so let's look into that. Um, first of all, uh, let's talk about reduction. What possibilities do you as a service provider, as a tourism service provider actually have to reduce your uh, carbon emissions? I would like to talk about four areas in particular and give you examples from our Green Clean Network. On the one hand, about sustainable purchasing, waste minimization, water conservation, and energy efficiency. And I think this slide already shows, and there's so much more behind. I um, thank you, Chris, for also mentioning um, the social aspect of uh, net zero and the social aspect of the sustainability of tourism and hospitality. Um, so in general, I think the, the beauty of sustainability, and I know I have to say that because of the organization that I work for, but I truly believe that the great thing is that actually um, the actions you can implement, the variety is uh, limitless, I would say. And um, so let's dig into it in detail. Um, uh, sustainable purchasing. Um, one of our establishments on the Maldives, for example, they are using, they're doing in-house farming. Um, they have several agricultural products grown on the island um, in their restaurant. Most of the main ingredients are from locally grown or organic agricultural products, which of course reduces the emissions generated through import and transportation. Then this is a great example of the Bank Hotel in the Netherlands. Um, as you can see on the picture, um, this hotel used to be a church. So instead of uh, throwing out all the resources that have already been used, they actually integrated um, uh, the elements from the um, former church in the design of their hotel. So the wall that you can see on the left is actually old benches of uh, the hotel. And now there is the accommodation, the beds behind um, this wall. And you can also see that the orgula is still there. So instead of throwing out um, what has been used before, um, there is, uh, think about what possibilities do I have to actually refurbish or reuse, um, rethink the, the ways your products um, or former products uh, have been used. And one more example, something very simple, coming back to the topic of raising awareness, is um, uh, introducing the locals that you work together with to your, um, to your tours, to your travelers, as it has been done here by the Hotel Hebron in Denmark. Um, then uh, the second area, waste minimization. Um, the Story Resort in the Seychelles has implemented several actions when it comes to reducing their waste. They are not using any, any single-use plastic in the premises. They use bulk dispensers um, uh, instead of single-use amenities. And um, all the materials um, are from natural ingredients, such as wood, as you can see in the picture below. They don't use plastic straws, and instead of printed material, all the guest information is now available on QR codes. Um, so those are just a, a few actions of um, that actually can have a really big impact when it comes to the amount of waste that is reduced, that is produced on a daily basis. Um, I was just recently traveling to Asia and in Asia it's a, it's still a common practice that there is um, single use amenities in every hotel room no matter where you go and actually that's a lot of waste that is produced um, on a daily basis and um, it's actually something that's not really needed. 
Um, but of course, if those things are there, it increases the possibilities of tourists um, taking it with them. Um, and it again, I mean, we are talking about turning net zero into net, net profit. That's a lot of costs that are involved here as well. Um, another great example is from the Lions Dive Resort in Curaçao. Um, they uh, started a green bottle initiatives where upon arrival, all of their um, guests receive um, a bottle, um, a refillable water bottle, and they can refill the bottle um, everywhere um, on the resort premises and also on the beach, which of course decreases um, the amount of single use plastic bottles immensely. Um, something that shouldn't be forgotten when it comes to waste is food waste, um, a very big topic, especially in the tourism industry. And as I mentioned earlier, in order to be able to um, set concrete actions, you need to understand where you're at. So one of the examples I have with you uh, with me today is from the Hotel Korpilampi in Finland. Um, and maybe you've seen this before. They use the winnow uh, tracking system for food waste um, that actually can help them um, to understand what are the most intensive times of the day where food is uh, food waste is produced, and then they can set the right actions. Or something really simple. Um, um, but effective as it is done by the Lorarica resorts in Suriname. Um, they have these um, recycling containers throughout the resorts that also are engaging. And um, um, as you can see, uh, it says keep keeping our planet healthy. So it's also about raising awareness and including the tourists in your actions. Then um, energy efficiency and emission reduction. Let's go back to the different scopes. So when it comes to the direct emissions on um, the direct consumption um, that is created um, in your establishment, I have a great example with me, which is the Hotel Jakarta in the Netherlands. They actually have a complete, completely energy neutral building. It's a beautiful hotel um, that has a complete jungle inside the hotel. And what their building does, uh, one example is that the windows are automatically open based on the inside room temperature. So if it's getting too warm inside, the windows will open making sure that it cools down, um, which reduces the need of um, using air conditioning or such. And the windows actually also have solar panels on them, as you can see in the picture. Um, and all the plants that are inside the hotel are watered with treated wastewater and rainwater, which reduces the water consumption. Then um, talking about scope two. So when it comes to scope two, this mainly includes all the emissions that are generated from electricity that you need to buy from external um, sources. So when it comes to um, island states, um, I uh, hear very often from our green key establishments that the amount of renewable energy that it, um, is available to be bought is limited. So our um, green key establishment in Curaçao, the Lions Deep Dive Beach Resort, um, decided to uh, do it themselves and actually um, installed about 600 solar panels on their roofs and they aim to increase that up to 900 panels um, to cover the daytime use of electricity. Um, and they also use that electricity to charge the, um, their electric cars. Water conservation, um, talking about scope free, uh, free emissions, the biggest share, uh, the Fisherman's Cove Resort is actually um, focusing on a lot of different actions uh, when it comes to the sustainability and to their path towards net zero. I would like to highlight two of them, which are specifically connected to water. On the one hand, they have um, water from two boreholes um, uh, from the ocean and the natural lagoon, which is reused in the guest bedrooms and for laundry. And they also use pressure sensors on water pipes, which is something really important because those sensors help them to react quickly in case there are any leaks. Um, so those were my first few examples um, of uh, our green key establishments. But um, in the end, uh, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand. And we will understand only what we are taught. 
So why am why am I having why did I include this quote? Um, because the point is, and that's again the foundation for environmental education. If we are not being taught about the importance of um, sustainability for our surroundings, about the impact we have on the biodiversity of uh, of the actions that we take um, in when traveling, um, we will not be able to take uh, informed decision. So besides all these great initiatives, it's of course also important to invest in human capital through training and development. Um, Something that is done very um, frequently by our, by our establishments is, for example, organizing beach cleanups together with guests. Um, and we also get a lot of feedback that that's taken very positively. And, for example, the Redison hotels in Madagascar have implemented community action months where they planted trees, where they were also doing beach cleanups and um, a lot of more actions. So I understand that um, when it comes to sustainability and the path to net zero, it can be a bit challenging to know where to start. And the WTTC report that Chris uh, shared um, has summarized the most frequent challenges. Um, I, however, would like to look at the opportunities um, talking about our green key establishments. So one of the challenges that we hear a lot is um, it's difficult to define a long term net zero target. Um, Green Key can help because our criteria, it is required for you to set targets um, and establishments are also needed to reflect on the targets and the actions they implemented in previous years. Um, when it comes to the dedication of team, I actually got some great feedback from one of our hotels that said that the process of working towards a common goal, such as the sustainability, the net zero, um, uh, the path to net zero creates a bond in the team. And for that hotel in Madagascar, um, he actually explained to me that trying to make a difference makes them the most preferred employer in hospitality on the island. Um, then let's look into external challenges. On the one hand, um, there is the idea that there is limited willingness to pay for sustainable products. While that's probably still the case for some travelers, there's also a lot of um, development in terms of that uh, travelers prefer to stay in sustainable um, properties and that it actually increases the interest um, towards an establishment. When it comes to the affordability, I also got some great feedback from one of our hotels that says that the return on investment that many hotels uh, Many hotels still don't see the return of investment. Uh, he gave the example that their filtered water installation was paid back in less than a year. Um, and finally, when it comes to reporting, uh, we can also help. Uh, there is a green key carbon calculation tool. We have some benchmarking um, that can help. So um, I'm a little bit over time, so I'm going to talk you through real quickly um, through the removal part of. Um, of the path to net zero. Um, so I would like to focus, there's a lot of technologies already out there when it comes to um, removing carbon emissions from the atmosphere, but I would like to focus on two of them um, because our oceans and our forests are actually natural carbon sinks. So we need to use the natural resources that we have for that element particularly. Um, to give you an example, uh, the Villa Nautica Paradise Island Resort in the Maldives is um, uh, started an initiative to preserve and rehabilitate uh, coral reefs uh, because coral reefs are actually helping to reduce or to remove uh, carbon emissions out of the atmosphere. And um, an initiative from us, from the Foundation for Environmental Education is the Global Forest Fund. That's a carbon, carbon compensation initiative that we started here at FEE that can help individuals and businesses to reduce their carbon footprint. We invest in um, tree planting um, projects that combine environmental education um, together with community work, which um, um, increases the long-term effect. So how do we from Free and Green Key help? We give you a guidance and a framework 
Uh, we have a lot of different tools and resources. I also added um, a QR code here. If you're interested, we um, have a lot of free webinars and trainings as well that anyone from the tourism industry is welcome to join. The next one is on the 31st of August um, on circular economy and tourism. Um, and uh, if you're part of Green Key, you also receive access to our network, um, which can help you to get inspired on your path to net zero. Um, we have more than 4,600 establishments worldwide uh, right now. So the few examples that I gave you, I could be talking for hours about our hotels, but I'm uh, gonna stop in a minute. Um, the key learnings that I would like to take you um, is that on the one hand, you need to start to identify your emission intensive areas of operation and based on those set realistic targets. Then you need to implement um, resource saving procedures, switch to renewable um, resources if possible, and identify possibilities to create negative emissions, to remove emissions um, from the atmosphere. You need to reskill your whole team and create a sustainable value chain. And finally, you need to involve your customers, staff, and stakeholders in the process to create a actual holistic sustainable product. That's it from my side. You're welcome to um, contact any of us um, uh, after this webinar. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Claudia, for that very in-depth presentation and some practical steps that we see some of your members have taken on to get on that path to reaching net zero. That was wonderful. Um, Next, we are going to hear. Next, we're going to hear from Ewald Beemans. He's the owner and operator of Bakudi Antara Resorts in Aruba. Um, while we are pulling up his presentation, I just want to share with everyone: if you have any questions about any of these presentations, please feel free to put them in the Q and A box below at the bottom of your screen. We are excited to hear from Ewald now to talk about his own journey for net zero. We saw examples, and now we're going to hear from a practitioner himself who has been leading the way in terms of sustainability for quite some time time in the Caribbean. Um, they've tackled carbon neutrality and they're looking at getting net zero. Um, let's hear from Ewald as he walks us through how his uh, resort has been innovative in this quest to turn net zero into net profits. Ewald, I yield the floor to you. Thank you. It's a great honor for me to be here. I heard a lot of good things today and a lot of progress already made. I'm Ewald, uh, I'm the owner and CEO of Bukuti Antara Beach Resort, a carbon uh, uh, neutral resort in the Caribbean, or the only carbon neutral resort in the Caribbean to this moment. Um, we are on our way to net zero, and I might have to talk to uh, Ms. Claudia a little bit uh, later on uh, in terms of uh, the uh, certification for um, net zero. Um, next slide, please. We started our journey in 1992, or shortly after the Rio Climate Conference uh, uh, that, uh, in that year. And uh, in, in, within that period of time, we heard about Green Globe as the first uh, certification scheme for hotels and tourism attractions. And so we, we, um, we lined up, we signed up with Green Globe, and uh, they provided us with a roadmap to uh, become certified uh, green. Um, later on, we uh, certified uh, ISO 14001. And, uh, and then because of the demands from the tour operators in Europe that wanted a certification, we became Travel Life certified. Uh, as we had these three certifications, we felt that we, uh, with a little extra effort, we could become LEED certified. LEED certified is, of course, for a hotel of extreme importance because it helps you address uh, mostly energy, which is one of the biggest costs and the biggest uh, challenges in our industry. Air conditioning, of course, and uh, water, uh, especially on islands like Aruba, which is a desert island, and so we uh, got certified of, uh, with, green, with uh, LEED in uh, 2012. And after we certified uh, LEED, we became LEED Gold. And the next natural step was to become certified carbon neutral. The next slide, please. 
Uh, and so how do we do this? Uh, it is a long process. It's not, uh, it did not happen overnight. But today we have the largest solar panel installation in Aruba. We, uh, we produce about 25% uh, of our energy uh, through our solar panels. We have solar water heaters for the entire consumption of the hotel. Uh, we temperature control every room and every public area that is air conditioned. Um, we have energy generating equipment in our gym. In other words, we put our customers to work. So while they, while they burn energy, they produce energy for the hotel. And there's a monitor in the gym that says exactly or indicates exactly how many light bulbs they've been uh, lighting up or how many um, gas, gas tanks they have filled with their exercise. Um, we use ex ex exclusively energy savings appliances, and they're, of course, they're uh, rated. Uh, we use heat exchangers and heat pumps to warm or heat water. And uh, we do, in our kitchens, we use uh, induction heating practically exclusively. Uh, induction heating, of course, reduces a lot of um, heat uh, that is created by dispersion. And, uh, and it, it increases your need for air conditioning in your, in your, in your restaurant and in your kitchens. And uh, it, it overall, it provides a lot of um, less heat loss and a lot of savings. Um, we, we do an all around uh, insulation of the hotel, or we did over the years, uh, including for the LEED certification. And, and just recently, we applied a coating uh, in, uh, on our exterior of the hotel that is a German manufacturer and is a coating that reflects heat. And then we painted our rooms inside with that similar coating, which in return reflects the cold inward. So um, together with a um, new VRF uh, air conditioning system, we have been able to uh, reduce additionally uh, our energy consumption by about 25%. So this is this is a, a, a new a, a new product, and it's called MIG, and it is uh, produced in Germany. Uh, of course, we uh, we have a hundred percent LED uh, LED uh, illumination, and we're installing the latest technology in VRF or air conditioning uh, variable frequency uh, units. Next slide, please. Uh, the other um, extremely costly and uh, CO2 emitting um, item is water. Uh, in Aruba, our water is produced uh, by distilling seawater or by reverse osmosis. And so we have reduced our water consumption dramatically. We use low flow toilets, low flow sinks, aerators, and so forth, indigenous plants in our gardens exclusively so that we don't have to. Um, uh, water extensively, uh, or uh, we have a whole program of towel and linen reuse in the rooms. Uh, the rooms are not made up every day uh, unless the customer demands it. And then we recycle our gray water entirely from our showers, our sinks, and our laundry. And uh, and of course the uh, the the gray, the um, the toilets and so forth. They are they are then brought to the uh, to the recycling the water recycling plant by the government we also capture all rainwater and uh, and make use of it in our gardens and the gray water is exclusively used for our gardens uh, uh, mainly ornamental plants next slide please the other area that we have uh, really made big progress is a waste diversion and waste diversion has helped us reduce our emissions. Um, we have already um, started in the 1980s uh, by not using any plastic. So we have eliminated plastic about uh, 30, over 30 years ago. A guest and staff uh, are all given a water canteen, uh, a stainless steel container that is insulated and we have uh, this, uh, dispensing units throughout the hotel. And we use these contains for about 20 years now. And uh, they, people are free to take them home 
they uh, they are a slight uh, value of about five dollars a piece but people love them and people use them we have eliminated plastic uh, water bottles uh, over uh, I think about uh, almost half a million bottles per year we only buy per uh, bulk purchases in other words anything that uh, that that is needed in the hotel is bought in major quantities in large large dispensers large uh, uh, containers and so forth and uh, toilet dispensers of course in the rooms are ready for like 30 35 years and we use a, a, a local product called Aruba Aloe, which is very much in demand by our customers. And of course, we refill these dispensers uh, daily so that there is no problem. Uh, we are at this moment over 90% paperless in the hotel. Everything there is possibly done uh, without paper is all done electronically. While we were building or expanding or uh, recycling, we used uh, floors in a fitness center that are made uh, from recycled tires. We use re uh, construction material. Um, uh, we use recycled cement and uh, uh, and mix it with glass. We have recycled asphalt in our in our parking lot, and uh, we of course separate glass, carton, aluminum, and oils uh, for recycling. We, reduce, we reuse everything that we can possibly reuse, including carton. Uh, we, use, uh, we use them as welcome cards uh, for um, to hang on the doors. Towels in the fitness center are made from towels that are large towels that are, might, might have a stain or might have a little damage. Uh, they are reduced to smaller towels and reused. Laundry bags and coasters are made out of old sheets, pillowcases, and bedspreads. Clippings and garden waste are composted and then reused. Next slide, please. Then here is another item that, uh, for instance, I just recently uh, saw a statistic that food waste globally represents about 15% of CO2 em emissions globally. So here is actually an answer. Uh, if we could just reduce our um, or uh, food waste, uh, we would already be uh, much better off in our uh, aim to um, to um, uh, net zero. Food waste, uh, we have reduced our food waste by 30% in our restaurants. And simply by doing this, we used to serve American portions. And we uh, noticed that 30 or 40% of the food could always go back and be wasted. So we reduced our portions all of our portions by about 30%. We reduced our prices a little bit. And now we experience that our customers are happy. They uh, purchase more appetizers and more desserts. Um, we also reduced our food waste from the buffet. We have a buffet in the morning and from our employees cafeteria, which is also a buffet, by another 30% uh, through a pilot program of the World, World Wildlife Federation. We recycle every food scrap and we use it for local farmers, including my own little farm and home. Next slide. The other program that we address is safe cleaning and pest control. We only use natural, organic, or non-toxic cleaning materials, and they are EPA LEED approved, and they're hospital grade uh, cleaning products uh, for safety for internal and external customers. We use organic fertilizers and we use the compost uh, from, from our hotel. EPA approved the non-toxic pest control, in some cases using all natural products. We use, uh, our pool is not chlorinated, or our pool is saltwater electrolysis uh, um, uh, maintained, and so it is safe and it has zero um, uh, chlorine uh, use. And then our laundry is uh, ozone uh, is cleaned by ozone. Next slide, please. Then for external and internal gas safety and security, we use UVC lighting in our uh, well, UVC technology for disinfection of our guest rooms. We use uh, UV irradiation for um, Legionnaire's disease prevention. We have a full HACCP uh, uh, food safety program and a full health and safety program for our staff and our guests, and a fitness membership for our staff and strictly healthy employees' meals. We don't serve sweets, we don't serve uh, the sodas, and uh, our, our meals are composed of uh, 
uh, fruits, vegetables, whole, whole foods. And, uh, and by the way, we also eliminated beef in our restaurant, except one beef item in our, in our restaurant is still available. And in our cafeteria, we do not serve beef because beef is one of the largest emitters of CO2. We also offer a fitness membership for our staff and mental health support for our staff. Next slide, please. And then we have an extensive stewardship or community outreach program. Um, of course, we only purchase local stuff. We only purchase local, um, or we only employ local uh, help. Uh, we invest in sustainable local initiatives and we support local arts, crafts, and cuisine in our hotel. All our artwork is done by local artists. And then we support local artists and musicians uh, and, uh, and support entertainers. And we invite locals and staff, uh, staff family members to participate in our sustainability program. Next, please. And a further community outreach program, we have a Stimami, Sterilizami means love me and sterilize me program, whereby we uh, spay and neuter about 500 dogs and cats every month. Uh, we actually pay for the, for the sterilization. And uh, at this moment, uh, over the last six and a half years, we have done over 35,000 animals. It doesn't sound like a lot to, to people that live in a, in a large country, but for a small island with 100,000 uh, inhabitants and 35,000 homes, uh, to spay and neuter 35,000 animals uh, has made an impact. And we have reduced the uh, stray animal or the stray dog and cat population dramatically. We, uh, we just recently established uh, the Bukutitara um, Nature Preserve. It's a 33-acre uh, uh, nature preserve of pure virgin Aruban um, landscape in the middle of uh, the most busiest um, uh, tourist area called Palm Beach. And these 35 uh, acre uh, land will now be uh, reforested. We have a, a group called uh, Get Up and Plant or in Papiamento called Plante Planta, and they are busy. Uh, reforesting that area with about 15,000 plants. It's become our um, carbon sink, in other words. Uh, we are supporters of Tortuga Ruba, which is a turtle conservation program. We have about 35 to 50 nests uh, in our vicinity here on our beach every year. And these are then taken care of and then uh, made sure that they leave and re hopefully return 20 years later uh, as uh, new visitors uh, to Aruba. Then we have a pack for the pack for a purpose program, which we address to the local um, um, uh, home for children, and then we have a donkey sanctuary, which we support uh, old donkeys that are then taken care of, and uh, wild donkeys are then uh, corralled and and placed there. And then uh, we support the animal shelter and the local arts and crafts uh, at the resort. Uh, uh, we bring in local uh, artists and, and they then sell their local arts and crafts to our customers. Um, next slide. So I have enumerated uh, only highlights here. The list is very, very long and uh, it accounts for over 400 action points. And I think I'm 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 only touching the uh, or I'm sure only showing the tip of the iceberg. But there's a lot more that can be done, and there's a lot more that we do. Uh, and so the next journey uh, is now, of course, uh, we are aiming for net zero, and it should happen within the next year. And uh, how how are we planning to do that? We funded and established the uh, the 32 acre uh, nature preserve and uh, the reforestation, which then will become a, a carbon sink. Um, we are expanding our solar um, panel generation and investing in alternative energy. There is a new wind farm um, to be established in Ruva, and we hope to invest some, some of our funds there and then purchase renewable, more renewable energy. At this moment, we are already purchasing um, from wind farms on the island, we are purchasing about 20, 25% of our energy. 
we're, we're of course working on reducing our methane emissions. Uh, we are financing solar and inverter technology for our staff members. We are financing electric vehicles for our staff members and our, our whole uh, vehicle fleet is, uh, um, is electric. And then we facilitate green loans for staff because it also will become uh, 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 part of the program because part of the um, uh, even lead uh, certification is transportation to and from work and transportation of goods and services that we import. And so we're trying to reduce both uh, the emissions created by transportation, both from staff members uh, or internal uh, transportation and uh, including um, transportation of goods and services we bring in from the United States and all over the world. Aruba has no products or is, has no agriculture, has zero uh, growth uh, manufacturing of anything. And so everything is imported, including the people of Aruba. The next slide, please. So in, 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 in uh, resuming, we have proven uh, that luxury and environmental sustainability are not exclusive, are not mutually exclusive. They go very well hand in hand. And, uh, and the other thing that I need to mention is that the program is scalable to any operation and it is 100% replicable. You can, you can scale it to, to, to the, the, the minor parts of it or you can do the whole program. And we are willing to help anybody that is uh, uh, willing to um, look at, at, uh, at our program and help them uh, um, establish that. Uh, and, and finally, all I can say is the proof is in the pudding. We run a year round occupancy of 95%. And uh, we do an average, or I would say a ref bar of about $500, $600 per day, per, per room. And so um, in, 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 in other words, we, um, we have proven that success um, is very well um, uh, possible and that our customers actually, uh, and, and somebody mentioned it in, in one of the presentations before, uh, people today are looking for a sustainable re, uh, green hotels. They will prefer to stay in a place and feel less guilty for traveling. And we have proven another thing that um, traveling, uh, to Aruba and staying with us in a carbon neutral hotel is actually less emissions than if they would stay at home and would do, uh, or stay at home uh, in the United States, for instance, and do the, the, the daily activities they would do. Because the, the fact that they spend seven nights in a carbon neutral hotel, it will offset a lot of the um, emissions that they have created through the, through the flights. So in other words, uh, we are willing to help anybody. Um, th this program or, or, or mo a more extensive PowerPoint or, or Canva presentation is available for anybody that is interested. And I thank you all for allowing me this uh, short presentation. Thank you so much, Ewald. That was a lot of information to unpack. And I'm sure all of our attendees have taken note of the many things that you are doing. Um, and I actually, that's interesting that staying at your hotel is different because, you know, most people say when people go on vacation and they travel, they are the most wasteful that they can possibly be. So it's good to know that when hotels take this charge to become carbon neutral and put in a lot of the innovations and the um, set points that you put in and action points that they can actually reduce their carbon footprint than if they were to stay at home. So um, we're changing minds and hearts slowly but surely. And now I'm going to open up the floor for questions. I know we have a few coming in. Um, and I'm going to start. I think we have one for Chris. I have a question for you. Um, the question is, do you think this high carbon emissions rate for the Caribbean can have a detrimental impact long term on travel demand for the region? Um. So I, I mean, I think that uh, emissions and, and carbon is, is a global problem, right? Uh, and I think that uh, we got to get the emissions right at a global scale, and that needs to start locally as well, because you, uh, an island state will be much more vulnerable in terms of, of 
ocean acidification, ocean sea rises and everything. So there's a very, very strong, let's say, nature-based imperative for getting it right um, and, and, and taking action on that soon and encouraging others to do so. And we've seen some impassioned speeches from Caribbean leaders at the COPs as well, which has been, yeah, a very inspiring. Whether the follow-up has been quite as inspiring by others is, is, is a much more debatable thing. Um, but I take your question perhaps to be around reputation, uh, you know, whether green action is seen as something that attracts uh, visitors. I think that that is a, a very interesting question. I, it's not one that I have a definitive answer to, um, but I, I do believe that in the long run, destinations that are seen as being green and natural and taking care of their environments, their people, and, and authentic in doing so, will have a competitive advantage over other destinations. This, I, you know, is something that we see through surveys, through what people, what people are saying, and I believe that this will translate into action as well. I agree to that as well. I mean, I was reading a recent- And, and I think you can just ask Ewell. I mean, he's, he's developed a very strong brand. Yeah. So, sorry, my internet connection. No, no worries. I was saying um, I, I couldn't agree to that fact. Um, just recently, I was reading a study through McKinsey and they were looking at surveying hotels of the future, tourism of the future, and what that looks like and what our um, travelers will be looking at, what our guests are looking for. And each of the CEOs emphatically said sustainability was one. And obviously having that guest experience and understanding what our client wants is the other. So we're seeing those trends um, go towards people wanting to have more of a green destination, a green stay. And then, you know, the question of partnerships with airlines, we're seeing that transportation is huge in terms of our carbon emissions and our carbon footprint as we rely so heavily on travel to our tourism destinations. And it also is coupled with our GDP, making sure that we structure these partnerships with airlines that have these, you know, staff, you mentioned it earlier in your, in, um, your talks, about having sustainable aviation fuel and making sure that as a region, we're partnering with these various um, you know, organizations that have that as a priority because as a region together, we have to get down these emissions because as you can see, we're kind of up there in terms of our comparison to the world stage, which is unique. Um, yeah. You also think as the global South, we contribute the least to climate change. But as you mentioned, when you take out the travel and tourism sector specifically, you know, we have some differences and things to really account for there. So that's very interesting. Yeah. Um, if, if I could just add, we, we have done a piece on, on sustainable aviation fuel. Typically sustainable aviation fuel has been the remit and the, you know, the area of investigation of, of airlines and uh, airline aviation associations. But we have to remember that we are the downstream beneficiaries of aviation. It is a destination issue, not an aviation issue, because if we don't get it right, we will have perhaps uh, distorted pricing that affects us. We have regulations that will affect us. Travel patterns might change. So in, in our report, we do make a recommendation that tourism stakeholders beyond aviation take an interest, engage with their governments on this issue, perhaps even look at the possibility of local staff development feasibility studies because there are economic opportunities in this. Yes, I agree. And we do rely a lot on our foreign overseas travelers. We can also start looking more into developing more of our inter-Caribbean and regional travel as well, and looking yeah. at different ways in which we can do that. I mean, there are flights that are running fully electric these days between smaller areas. We need to see how we can get into that innovation as well. Um, thank you, Chris. I have a question for um, Ewald. Ewald, there's a question from one of our um, people who are on um, who's asking, well, we already answered the question about surveying guests and green practices. So I hope that answered your question, but they wanted to understand the net revenue impact of some of these green practices that you've been implementing at Bakuti, um, understanding that some may be difficult to quantify, um, such as ordering a dessert or because main meals wasn't more consumed, but are there any, have you seen any differences before or after implementing practices that can be measured? I, I, we, we did not really set out to measure things. Uh, our aim was from day one to preserve as much of our environment. Um, that um, so, and as as we developed uh, the program, uh, we added uh, and invested in in certain cases. And of course, you when you when you talk about solar panels or a VRF uh, uh, air conditioning system, you look at what is the paper 
payback period. And some of these items are, the payback is very, very short. Some of the items maybe take two or three or four years. It's a matter of investment, but looking at long-term profits rather than things. But we have not really sat down and said, well, we're making so much money or we're saving so much money. The idea was more climate change is, 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 a, is a threat to us. Let's do our, our utmost in preserving our little uh, part of the world here so that uh, hopefully everybody else joins us. So uh, as to the food um, uh, reduction or the food portion reduction, all we saw is an increase in sales. First of all, the, 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 the many items uh, were now less expensive for the customers. So they, they had, and, and the, the, the portions were smaller, so they were able to, to buy an appetizer or dessert, which in the past they couldn't because the portions were so huge. And it has brought uh, less waste. Less waste means also less transportation of goods and services because everything in Europe is imported. And so if you bring in 100 pounds and you save 30% of that, you only bring in 70, 70 pounds. And 70 pounds times $1 per pound flying it in or, or 30 cents per pound shipping it in is emissions and is savings. So... No matter what you you will gain with any of these programs, and uh, there are very few um, payback periods that maybe exceed six or seven years. The rest is all low hanging fruit. So I would recommend anybody to, if nothing else, if you're not concerned about the environment, at least be concerned about your pocketbook, because through through your pocketbook, you will also save the environment. Excellent. Thank you. And for Claudia, um, this is a question for you. I know that many of your members are engaging in a lot of different um, action items to help reduce and lower their emissions. Um, you mentioned two things. You mentioned about reducing and removing. What are some of the things that you're seeing some of your members do to remove um, their, um, their, their emissions as opposed to just trying to reduce them through typical methods? Um. Yeah, I, I, I started giving a few examples. So I think um, the two elements that, that are important here are on the one hand, looking at our oceans and making sure that they are healthy. Um, and then on the other hand, looking at our forests and making sure that those are healthy because those are natural carbon sinks. And Ewell gave a, a lot of great examples of what can be done on, on both elements and what our members are focusing on when it comes to these areas are looking at the restoration of coral reefs, for example, um, something very simple, um, such as planting trees, um, making sure we have one member that actually um, did a um, meadow creation, like a natural meadow creation to ensure that actually uh, the bees are coming back, all the insects are coming back and the biodiversity. So it's really like these actions and um, Involving everyone in the community is, I think, something really important as well, because if you do that, then the action you will be taking is sustainable in the sense that it's supported and carried by everyone that is involved, and um, then it has a long-term effect. I love that answer about getting the community involved and engaging others because a lot of the times we're afraid to change and do it on our own. When the community is there and you're seeing what you can do as a community, not just as one standalone hotel, it can be cumbersome, but as a community, as you get together to look at reduction efforts, that can also help inspire, inspire you to get on the pathway to net zero. Well, folks, I thank you so much for your time. We're just about at 11.15. We are wrapping up. Um, this has been a wonderful presentation. We got to see a global trend and a view to give a nice understanding of where we are as a region in terms of travel and tourism and what our carbon front is there. We know we have a lot of work to be done there. Thank you, Claudia and Ewald, for giving us practical examples from your own operations and your memberships operations. Again, to all attendees, this webinar is being recorded. We will have the presentations available for you, um, for you to get involved with. Um, we ask that you um, also look to us as CHTA and CATS for resources. You heard about reduction and removal, looking at Biodiversity and Ocean Sinks. CAST has amazing partnerships with the Nature Conservancy and the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund that are looking at projects to help you all engage in different ways that you can help contribute to your pathways to net zero. I ask that you join CHTA, get involved with CAST, and look at the various resources that we have. 
We hope to see more of that in amazing data from WTTC with Chris and his team. Um, and once that's out, we hope that we can share that with you guys, our members. Again, thank you so much for your time. This will be available in 48 hours after everything posted to our CHTA website. Register for Chief. We hope to see you. And thank you again. We hope you enjoyed our webinar. Take care, everyone.